Warning, the content of this video deals with violence and sexual harassment. Are you comfortable with violence in video games and scenes like this? Or this? If you're not comfortable with violence in video games, then I suggest caution watching this video. But look, all of the images you will find in this video, you can easily find them anywhere in YouTube. Is it wrong to play violent games? Is it morally bad to kill and rob people in GTA? If playing violent games makes the person more violent, then yeah, they would be bad. But what if they don't? What if playing violent games don't make you more violent? Then it's okay, right? I mean, it's all virtual, it's all fictional. As long as nobody's getting harmed, then it's all fine. But if it's all fictional, then shouldn't we allow anything? Shouldn't we allow games even with sexual harassment? We have a dilemma here. We accept killing in GTA because it's all virtual. But we don't accept other forms of crime, such as sexual harassment, even though they are virtual. Shouldn't we accept all of them? That's the gamer's dilemma. And in this video, we will break down this dilemma and we will analyze the limits of violence in video games. And because we'll talk about the limits of violence, we will have to address what is beyond those limits. GTA is just at the tip of the iceberg. There are games far more violent than GTA. And I hope YouTube doesn't delete this video. This is it! This is it! Come on! Oh, we're gonna run into the... <laughs> Come on, freaking train tracks. Oh, Jesus, I just heard a loud bang. Do you know the trolley dilemma? This dad is teaching his kid the dilemma. There is a runaway trolley barreling down the railway tracks. If you do nothing, the trolley will hit five people and kill them. But you can pull a lever which will change the direction of the trolley and he will only kill one person. What should you do? Should you save five in expense of killing one? Well, this kid has the perfect answer. Should we move the train to go this way or should we let it go that way? Which way should the train go? This way. Come on, it's funny, it's, a, it's such an absurd answer. And it's okay, right? I mean, those are just toys. This kid didn't do anything wrong. It's all fictional, it's all made up in our heads. Games are that, games are fiction. They are made up, they don't exist in the real world. They exist in the screen. But even though they're all fictional, the vast majority of the games, they have some context to the violence. In Hitman, we play as the Hitman, as the killer, and we have to kill some targets. And the game does a lot of work trying to tell us that they are bad people, that we are killing bad people. Your targets are Sanguinona Viktor Novikov and his partner Dalia Margolis, two of the most dangerous people in the world. As long as they are villains, violence is justified. Take any of these famous movies like Inglourious Bastards, Jung Unchained, or a game like Wolfenstein. It's against Nazis, so we can rejoice in violence. But sometimes I just like to cause mayhem in a game. I just like to shoot people in GTA or even in Hitman. Sometimes I replay the mission just to kill more people. There's this guy who got all of the NPCs and crushed them. In Skyrim, you can rob NPCs. And whenever I'm playing Skyrim, when I see a bucket, I just can't resist. But it's okay, I'm not robbing anyone in real life. There are no consequences, nobody's getting harmed by my actions. It's all fictional, it's all made up. Violent games are hugely popular. I'm talking about like Skyrim, Fallout, Witcher, Hitman, Ghost of Tsushima. They all have violence of some kind. And that's a testament of how, as a society, we accept killing in video games. I mean, as long as nobody's getting harmed, it's all right, right? But actually, maybe it's not. Although it's fictional, not everything is allowed. Take GTA, the classic example of violence in games. There are no kids in the game. Have you ever noticed that? No kids. Skyrim, you can kill anyone in Skyrim, almost anyone. But you cannot kill kids. There are some kids, you cannot kill them. And that's the same for so many games. Fallout as well. Fallout, there are some kids, but you cannot kill them. Well, actually, in Fallout 1 and 2, you could kill kids. It was only in Fallout 3 that the designers decided not to allow the players to kill kids. The graphics were getting better and the designers said that it would cross a line. However, it's not completely true that you can't kill kids in Fallout. In Fallout 4, in pretty much all endings, you side with one faction, press a button from afar, and explode other factions. In doing so, you kill the kids in these factions. But this doesn't feel like it crosses a line. Maybe because there is no graphic depiction of the kids dying. 
Does this make the designers of Fallout hypocrites? Well, maybe we are all hypocrites. Remember the trolley dilemma? In an experiment with people, 80% said that they would pull the lever that would change the railway tracks, killing one person and saving five. But there is a variation of that dilemma, where instead of pulling a lever and changing the railway tracks, you have to push a very fat man onto the tracks, which will stop the train, saving five people, but killing the fat man. It's essentially the same dilemma. In the same experiment, in this version, only 50% of the people said that they would push the fat man. Interesting, no? It's much easier for us to accept killing when it's far and indirect. When all you have to do is to push a button from afar, it doesn't feel so bad. But of course, none of that stopped the modders from finding a way to let the players explode kids' heads off in Fallout. Does this cross the line? Does it become ultra-violent? Violence against kids? It's not really okay, is it? But okay, maybe for many people, that doesn't cross the line. So what about a game like Hotline Miami 2? At the beginning of the game, it asks us if we are okay with scenes of sexual harassment. And when I play the game, of course I said I'm okay, I got curious, and I want to play the whole game, everything it has to offer. It's a very famous game. The game is action-packed, you already start like smashing people's heads off, and towards the end of that first part, that tutorial, there is a lady, and your character goes on top of her, and it's horrible, he starts raping her, it's terrible, and then the director says cut. It was all a movie. The thing is that like in the story of Hotline Miami 2, you're recording a movie and you are an actor. So that lady, she was also an actress. So that's okay, right? I mean, my character was not raping anyone. It was all a story. It was all fiction. It was not real. But that's a bit bizarre, isn't it? Because it is a game. So it's not real in the first place. I mean, it's not because there is a story that it became any less real. It was already not real, just by being a game. But this is strange, because if there wasn't this little story, I would feel so bad with that scene, so bad. I think for most of us, we feel this strong difference between exploding people in GTA and molesting an NPC. There is a game called Rape Play, and come on, look at the name of the game, Rape Play. I don't really have to explain, right? The objective of the game is to harass a woman. I don't know if Hotline Miami or Fallout cross the line between what is tolerable and what is not tolerable in violence in game. But I think that rape play crosses the line. However, it's all virtual. Even rape play, it's virtual. Nobody's getting harmed. And that is the gamer's dilemma created by the philosopher Morgan Luck. So let's make things super clear here. The dilemma consists of three statements. The first one is that most people accept virtual murder. Most people accept killing in video games like GTA because it's all virtual. The second statement is that there is no relevant difference between virtual murder and other forms of virtual ultraviolence, such as virtual sexual harassment, because it's all virtual. The third statement is that most people don't accept virtual sexual harassment or other forms, more extreme forms of violence in games. Well, that's a dilemma, because these three things, they cannot be true at the same time. One of them has to be wrong. If we accept one, if we accept that it's okay to murder in a video game, and we accept two, if we accept that there is no relevant difference between one form of fictional crime, such as killing, and another, such as sexual harassment, then we should accept a game like Rayplay. But, well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to accept a game like Rayplay. So, there's only two things we can do. Either we say that the first statement is wrong, either we say that like violence in games is always wrong. So killing in a game like Skyrim or GTA, it's not good, it's bad. Or we accept that killing in games can be okay, but that there is a relevant difference between killing in those games and sexual harassment. All right, so let's start by the number one. When I was researching for this video, I got surprised to find that there are many authors who consider that GTA is a bad game. Not bad taste, but morally bad. There are many authors who think that any form of violence in video games is morally wrong. But to be completely fair, most of the arguments, they were centered on the idea of context. Context matters. Not all violence is the same. So you get a game like The Last of Us. 
Last of Us has a rich story, and the violence in there is justified. It's not violence for the sake of violence. Last of Us 2 tries to make the player feel bad for doing violence. Games are just another art form, and if we were to ban violence from all art forms, then we wouldn't be left with much. I mean, take Shakespeare for instance. Most of his works has a lot of violence. Romeo and Juliet, their suicide. Macbeth, it's filled with killing. Or take something more contemporary, like Hans May Tale. It has a lot of violence, but it is a commentary on the violence against women. So it's not just violence for the sake of violence. You can also make a parody, like the movies from Tarantino, Glorious Bastard, John Unchained, Kill Bill. They're a parody. GTA is a parody. It's not even a parody of real life violence. GTA is a parody of action movies from the 80s and 90s. Context is king, not only in games, but also here on YouTube. In the community guidelines, YouTube explains very well how you can show nudity and violence as long as there is some context. So for instance, you can make some documentary about indigenous people, and you show naked people. That's alright, because there is context. But if you cut the scenes of just the naked people, and you zoom in the naked bodies, then it's no longer a documentary about indigenous people, it's just porn. So YouTube doesn't allow videos where there is just nudity or violence without any context, because they don't want to promote these things. So for example, if I made a video which is a compilation of just killing video games, maybe that would not be okay for YouTube. And in theory, a video like this one is okay, because there is a context. We are talking about violence. We're not just showing violence for the sake of violence. In theory, you never know what the robots and algorithms in YouTube will find about this video. Maybe they will delete it. I don't know. So if you're enjoying this video, it would help me so much. If you like it and subscribe it, it would help a lot. And of course, there are games where there is violence just for the sake of violence. And I can only think of one game, Hatred. Hatred is a game about a psychopath. You're on a mission to kill people because you hate the word. It really a psychopath simulator. You shoot people and they scream in agony and they scream for their lives. And the only way to heal in the game is by executing people in agony. So really, it's a terrifying game. The designers of Hatred said that they wanted to create an ultra-violent game. They said, these days when a lot of games are heading to be polite, colorful, politically correct, and trying to be some kind of higher art, rather than just an entertainment, we wanted to create something against trends. We say, yes, it is a game about killing people. And the only reason of the antagonist doing that sick stuff is his deep-rooted hatred. My name is not important. What is important is what I'm going to do. I just fucking hate this world and these human worms feasting on its carcass. I didn't like the game. I didn't have fun playing the game. I had no fun role-playing a psychopath. It was not remotely enjoyable for me. But I understand their argument. Their argument is that like, you can have fun by just doing violence in a game, just for the sake of it. And I have done that. I have done that in GTA. In GTA, I have just like shoot people randomly. Or in Hitman, when I replay a quest, just shooting people. I mean, I can understand. Sometimes I had fun just doing violence in games. But although it's fun, it doesn't mean it's good. Take some junky food, like a burger or french fries. It's delicious, but it's unhealthy. Some authors, they argue that although GTA can be a lot of fun and ultra-violent games can be very fun to play, they are a vice. A vice is the opposite of a virtue. A virtuous action is not just something that it's a good action, it's something that will make you a better person and your life better. It improves your character. So for instance, if you do an act of bravery, you will become a more brave person, a more courageous person. And vice is the opposite. A vicious action will make you more miserable and your life worse. So these authors, they argue that playing GTA is a vice. When you shoot people, although you're not harming anyone, in the sense that you're not shooting people, you're not robbing other people, you are harming at least one person, you. Because it is a vice, it's a bad habit, it's not making you a better person. It's not making your life better. If these authors are right, then the good life is a life without any game like GTA or Skyrim. And well, I don't know about you, but I think that would be really boring. Maybe games are a way to experience violence, but not as vicious actions. Instead of pulling people in a coliseum 
and let them fight to the death like the ancient Romans did, we play games. We have to always keep in mind that games are not the real world. When we play games, we put our own agency in parentheses and we assume a different form of existence. So I can play God of War. Kratos in God of War, he has a miserable life and he has this thirst for revenge. So when I play the game, I don't have to face the misery of his life, but I can experience some of this thirst for revenge, and this feeling of power. But still, some authors fear that playing violent games might desensitize us to violence in the real world. The player would get so used to murdering the screen that they wouldn't care much when they see murder in real life. At many games, they try to dehumanize the target. Like in Zelda, Ganon is the essence of evil and you fight monsters. Or in Wolfenstein, you fight Nazis. But in Hatred, they do the opposite. They humanize the targets. The fun in Play Hatred is precisely to do something that feels evil. And that's very sick if you ask me. But still, I'm not certain if Hatred will desensitize people to violence in the real world. Well, that's an empirical question. Only through experiments we can find out really if these games can desensitize us. And that's a problematic question. We should do a video just for that, but just resume it. There are some experiments showing that there might be a correlation between playing violent games and having a violent behavior. And this could be related with not having the sensitivity to violence in the real world. But we have to be careful here not to confuse correlence with causation. Maybe people become violent, I don't know because they see their parents fighting all their time and they become a more violent person. And that person is just prone to play violent games at the same time that this person is prone to have more violent behavior. So in that case, there's something else causing the person to play violent games and to have a violent behavior. So the relation between playing violent games and having a violent behavior, it's a correlation, but not a causation. It's not that the games are causing people to become more violent. So in that case, the games are not bad in themselves. Maybe they can reveal something about the person, but they are not causing the person to become more violent. All right, so back to the dilemma. I don't think we managed to prove that one is false. One is that virtual murder is okay. And personally, I want to accept violence in video games. Dislike forms of violence, at least I consider the violence in GTA or in Skyrim light, or most of the violence in those games, it's rather light. And I say light, because I think sexual harassment is way heavier and darker. So let's try to show that there is a relevant difference between killing people in GTA and other forms of ultra-violence, like sexual harassment. I will present three reasons why they are different. The first is that murder is part of most gameplays. It's part of the mechanics of most games. Think of Mario, Zelda, even Minecraft has violence. Minecraft has some zombies, and when you play multiplayer, you can fight other people. You can even fight the villagers in Minecraft. The enemies in video games, they are a challenge. It makes more interesting to overcome these challenges and win the game. The game is more fun because of these challenges. If the game was just walking, there would be no challenge and it would not be entertaining. Most games have some form of killing, but in those cases, killing is a means to an end. The end is to beat the game and the means is to defeat the enemies. But sexual assault never is a means to an end. Sexual assault is always the end in itself. In rape play, the objective is to assault a woman, to harass a woman. That's the whole gameplay. So really, it's not much of a game. It's more a simulator. And it's an erotic game. And erotic games are fine by themselves, of course, as long as there is a context. And the context in rape play is, well, rape. And since this is the end of the game, is the goal of the game, that makes it a bad game. I think that's a good argument, but there are other two. Replay is a sexual assault simulator. So in that sense, it's offensive to women. I have said that when we play games, we put our agency in parentheses. Games are a way to experience different forms of living and of existing. Yeah, that much is true and games are fictional. However, games exist in the real world. Games are a discourse, like any book. A book, a story in a book is fictional. However, the book exists in the real world. And in the real world, violence against women is a serious issue. The same way that racism is a serious issue. A game where you have to kill just people from one ethnic background, that would be a racist game. 
and that would make the game bad because the game is offensive. Okay, these are good arguments to consider ray play as beyond the limits of what we can tolerate in video games. But what about other forms of ultraviolence? What about hatred, a game that's focused on being a psychopath? Hatred is not sexist or racist. In hatred, you have to kill everybody with no discrimination. But still, I feel like it's way too violent. There's a part in the game where you're in a train and you have to kill everybody in the train. That's what the game's about. And remember that in the game, you can only heal by executing people in agony. So the game always has some people laying around and they are not really a threat. They do not even run away from you. They are there just as like a healing potion. So I can understand that they play a role in the game mechanics. However, in that part of the game, the train, there are plenty of people hiding their seats. And there are just way too many to serve as a mechanism of healing potion. They are there just for the player to rejoice in slaughtering them. Killing is no longer a challenge. It's the end in itself. It's violence for the sake of violence. This takes us back to the talk about vice and virtues and about their correlation between violence and reward and violence in games. Maybe our concern isn't about the act itself, but what it reveals about the player. In World of Warcraft, there is a mission there where you get a rod to beat some slaves and you get a reward. So it makes sense. You play the mission many times so you can get the reward. But imagine there is a player who keeps playing the same quest over and over again. He gets the reward, but he keeps doing it. He keeps beating the slaves with the rod because he has pleasure doing that. Now, that feels bad, doesn't it? Even if we consider that he's not harming anyone, even if we consider that maybe this doesn't make him a worse person, it still feels wrong. But when I'm saying that it feels wrong, maybe it's just a boo. Maybe it's just my personal taste that's not aligned with that. I say that because I also enjoy violence and I think most of us enjoy some sort of violence. Take round six, the series Squid Games. You can criticize capitalism in many different ways, but there was a lot of blood in that series, a lot of killing. I think it's because we enjoyed all this violence. Game of Thrones with all those dragons. Why a dragon is so fascinating? Because of the power of the dragon. Dracarys. We are attracted to this power, to the power of killing as well. Vikings, basically all series, so many movies, they are about that. A movie like the movies from Tarantino or some other movies like B-movies, like these horror movies with a lot of violence. We are humans, we are not angels. The philosopher Susan Wolf has a really nice text called Moral Saints. In this text, she talks about how it's annoying to think of a person who thinks of themselves as a moral perfect being or acting as a moral perfect being. The essence of her argument is that morality is very important. It's maybe to the most important value in life, but it is not the only value in life. There are other things which makes life interesting, beautiful, valuable. So I think that my idea is what you want is a morality that is demanding, but not so demanding as to you know, wash out everything. But of course, this doesn't mean that everything is allowed. Morality is not the only value, but it's a still a value, maybe the most important. This means that when you do something else which is too aggressive, then it's too bad, you cannot do it. So something like killing an NPC in GTA, that's okay, okay, that's not a virtue, that's not the best thing you can do in your life. But it's different from playing a game like Rape Play. Rape Play would be a case where it's just too aggressive. It's too offensive. I have tried during the half of this video at least to prove that hatred is a bad game. That it's, we should put it as beyond the limits of what's tolerable. But to be completely fair, I don't think it is. I think that maybe it's just a taboo that I'm carrying. Maybe I think that hatred is a bad taste, but still, I cannot really prove that hatred is morally bad. And look, hatred is not the most violent game I have ever played. There are other games more violent, I don't know, Fausto, Manhunt, and I don't like those games either. But the most violent game I have ever played by far was Dungeons and Dragons. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons when I was a young teenager. I was 12, my brother was 14, and we had friends of the same age. We were all young teenagers. If you have ever played D&D, you know the feeling of freedom. It is amazing. 
no game comes even close to this feeling. The imagination is the limit. And it's just a fantastic game because it encourages you to imagine more things, other things. It's fantastic. And I remember we were playing once and there was a quest there to, I don't know, we had to save a village and from some goblins and we saved the village. And then we slaughtered everyone in the village, all of the villagers, just for fun. I have no idea why we did that. It was, I think it was just for fun. Because we could, because of that ultimate freedom that we could do in the game. We couldn't do those things in real life. And we have always been very peaceful people. I have never got into a fight in real life. But in Dungeons and Dragons, it was all about fight and those things. In D&D, you can choose your morality. You can choose to be good, neutral or evil. And you can choose to be lawful, neutral or chaotic. So you can choose to be lawful good. You're like a paladin for justice and the gods. Or you can choose to be chaotic evil, in which case you're a villain. This is a choice. You can have a party. Everyone in the group, they can all be villains. You can have a whole group made up of evil characters. You can role play a villain. I had a lot of fun playing Dungeons and Dragons. And usually I was a paladin, but sometimes we would do those things because it was a lot of fun. And isn't hatred a bit similar to this? You play as the villain. It's not like hatred is trying to convince the player that killing is good. It doesn't want to do that. It's just violence and there is violence, yes. And you, as a healthy human being, should know that that is too violent. The same with the movie Joker. I don't think the movie is trying to justify him as someone aggressive and justify his violence. He's a villain. That's the whole point. It's a movie about a villain. So yeah, I didn't enjoy hatred. I didn't have a good personal experience with hatred. But maybe someone else could. Maybe someone else will have that good experience of freedom and doing these things, these different things. So that in real life, we wouldn't dare to do the same things. Games allow us to experience what it is like to be a bad person. Games are like a controlled environment where we put our edges in parentheses and we can experience different forms. And games, because they're an interactive art, they are perfect to play with our morality. So take a game like Among Us, where you lie and you manipulate, and it feels good to lie and beat the others in Among Us and many other games. Cards games, most card games, there's a lot of lying there. Even when you play poker, there's some lying going on in there. Games are excellent for us to be mischievous without having to suffer the consequences of doing bad actions. So like lying, lying the real world can lead to very bad things, but not in a game. In Among Us, I can lie and that's okay. And that's where we can draw the line between the violence that we can accept and the violence that we cannot accept in games. In a game, we can behave different. We can have a different form of agency. And that includes things that we would consider bad, like acting as a villain, lying, murdering, all those things. But the game exists in the real world. When a game is offensive, that is beyond the safe space of the game. So you can have a game like Among Us where you can lie inside the game and that's okay. But a game that was designed to be racist or offensive to women like Rayplay is just offensive to women. That game is beyond its border. It's beyond the environment of the game. It's talking about the real world. It's offensive in relation to the real world. Games do not exist in a vacuum. They are played by people in real life, in the real world. So that's where we can draw the line. So hatred, although I think it's bad taste and I don't like the game, still it's inside a controlled environment. If hatred was really offensive in other ways, then it wouldn't be okay. For instance, if hatred was a simulation of one specific case of a psychopath, I don't know, United States, they have plenty of psychopaths. That's kind of a problem there. I don't live in the United States. And imagine that hatred is a simulation of one psychopath that existed in real life. That game would not be okay. That game would be offensive to the victims of that psychopath. When games touch the real world, that's where we can draw the line. Violence is part of being human and art has always helped us with dealing with these darker corners of humanity. Now, I don't think that GTA is as good and higher art as Shakespeare, but still, the things that I have learned and experienced playing Dungeons and Dragons 
I would never learn or experience with other art forms. Certain things are unique to game and they can have a huge potential also for us to learn by ourselves about morality. A game doesn't have to teach me what is the moral thing to do. Maybe I need to experience by myself and I will contrast my life experiences with the game and I'll build my own person. Maybe games can enrich my own life by experiencing these other lives. So I can play God of War and be Kratos. And I don't want to be miserable, like Kratos was miserable in the story of God of War. But I can feel his thirst for revenge and the power and this taste of blood of killing the Greek gods. To make this video, I have played plenty of violent games. And it was interesting for me to revisit some of them. GTA was one of them. I have played a lot of GTA when I was younger and I didn't really enjoy playing GTA nowadays. Nowadays that I can speak English much better, I understood the stories far better and there's a lot of parody in GTA. There's a lot of fun stuff in there as well. But there's a lot of stuff that, I'm not, I'm not gonna say bad taste, but it's just, I didn't like it. So let game designers be free to design games the way they want, as long as they have a notion that there is a real life out there, that there are things such as sexual violence, racism, and a series of other problems, and that whatever they do exists in the real world, so they need to be responsible for that. Okay, so where does this leave us? It's not just that some games would be bad, like Rayplay, also the way we play games. So if a person plays GTA, but they only kill women, for instance, that would be sexist. It's not like we can do whatever. All, I don't think that entertainment trumps morality. But still, at the same time, I don't think we should be oppressed by a moral system and not enjoying playing games like Among Us or even a game like Cards Against Humanity. But it's always like this. Philosophy never gives us clear answers. It just illuminates a little bit more the questions and the dilemmas. So what do you think about the Gamers Dilemma? Let a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe because I hope YouTube doesn't delete this video for saying all of these bad words. If you enjoy videos where there is an intersection between games and philosophy, then I recommend this video here. In this video, I talk about the intersection between many questions in philosophy and games. And as always, thank you so much for watching and see you next time.